Well, it gives me an uh, enormous uh, pleasure to welcome you this evening uh, for uh, Eagle Biography Project conversation between Prof. Prentice and Sir Dean Sedley. My name is Michael Lovell, I'm the Secretary <coughs> and the uh, Co-Director of the Eagle Biography Project. And my sole function is to introduce the, uh, the two speakers. Um, <coughs> So Stephen Sedley would, of course, uh, uh, be revealing a great deal more about his biography than I can give you in a, in a short introduction, so I'm not going to say very much. Save to say that he's, of course, uh, an extremely well-known, uh, very prominent lawyer, judge, and writer. One thing that uh, strikes me as a legal historian about uh, Sir Stephen is the, um, the range and interest of his in doing historical work, um, editing uh, early modern pamphlets, uh, in a, an edition of the works of John, Moore, of John Moore in uh, 1992, and also a series of, um, of books, including uh, articles that he's written in the, uh, the London Review of Books, where he's an extremely prominent uh, reviewer. I think he has more collections of books uh, coming out. He's also uh, found a way into the press in numerous other occasions. Uh, beloved is probably not the right word of the Daily Mail, but you can find uh, uh, many uh, references to him uh, there. Um, uh, have one from uh, Peter Hitchens describing him as uh, much more typical of the modern legal profession than he ought to be. <laughs> That's, That's a put down. Um, and he will be interviewed, of course, by, uh, by Sir Ross Cranston, um, uh, lately of this parish, as it were, uh, now since 2007, uh, a High Court judge, but uh, between 1992 uh, and 1997, holder of the Catholic Chair of Commercial Law in the LSE, and then again, uh, holder uh, of the Centennial Chair between 2005 and 2007, and now a visiting uh, professor, and of course, um, founder of the Legal Biography Project. So if I can uh, pass over to, to you for the evening. Michael, thanks very much. Um, first of all, can I apologize to people who are over there, because the way the seats are positioned <coughs> means that I've got my back to you, but you can all see Stephen, which is the important thing. Secondly, um, could I ask that any questions be in written form? Um, so if, you're, if you think you might um, ask a question, could you raise your hand now? <laughs> There's someone in the front. Uh, and uh, we'll get you to write down. But if in the course of the, um, the, the conversation you think that there's a question you might want to ask after or af afterwards, then um, our uh, LSE um, uh, assistants are going to, uh, will be able to hand you a piece of paper. Okay, let's start. Michael outlined uh, Stephen's brilliant career. Um, I'm going to start rather conventionally with your um, parents, and in particular, I want to ask you about your father, Bill Sedley. He was a partner of a firm of solicitors, um, Seaford and Sedley, and he was a long-time member of the Communist Party. Can you tell me something about him, his background, his legal practice, his relationship with you? Well, my father was a very quiet-spoken, scholarly man. Um, is this amplifying or just recording? Both. I think. Am, am I audible? Yes, yes. My father was a very quiet-spoken, scholarly man. He was the bright boy in a family of six children who grew up in very poor circumstances in Bethnal Green. He was born in 1909 in Bethnal Green. His parents were Jewish immigrants from Poland, which was then part of Imperial Russia. Um, he uh, won scholarship to um, Central Foundation School, and from there to this August institution, where he, his grant was um, three pence a day, and he had to choose between walking in and having a bun at lunchtime, or taking the bus in and not having anything to eat at lunchtime. He graduated as an economist in 1930 or thereabouts, which was not the best year for economists, <laughs> and had to start all over again. Um, he, he, to find articles in those days, until relatively recently, in fact, you needed to pay 300 guineas, which was completely out of the question. He finally found a, a father and son firm who took him for nothing. The father had been struck off, and um, they, needed, they needed a bright young man to run the office. So he learned a great deal very fast. 
became a considerable expert on the Rent Act. He was one of the very few lawyers on either side of the profession who actually understood the Rent Act and set up in practice on his own as what was then called a poor man's lawyer. It was a kind of primitive legal aid system in Bow, where the local county court judge, um, Tudor Rees, was um, less hostile to tenants than many of the London judges. Um, he <coughs> became a communist in those years. I don't know exactly how or when. I think he was probably quite strongly associated with the Bund Socialists, in, in, who were strong in the LSE. Um, and uh, he was very much part of his time. I have a photograph um, from his, his my mother's honeymoon in 1935, I think it was. He's sitting on the <coughs> edge of the big fountain in the um, Jardin des Invalides in Paris, Jardin du Luxembourg in Paris, with my father's cousin, Marie, and her husband, Joseph Bourstein. This is the time when the, the Popular Front was building in France, when Spain was about to elect a Republican government, when everybody knew that the threat of fascism was so powerful that it was going to result in war. And within a few years, um, Joseph had been executed by the Nazis uh, as a hostage. He was adopted with the resistance by 1940. Marie had been deported to Auschwitz, where she was killed. And this was the world that my parents inhabited. Uh, it's impossible for that not to have rubbed off on me to yeah. some extent. Um, <clears throat> my mother came from a much more prosperous family. Her family had arrived in 1913 from Switzerland. They were also Polish Jews. My maternal grandfather had ten children, of whom eight he put through professional training. Three doctors, two architects, my mother and her sister were physiotherapists and so on. Uh, and that was a remarkable thing in itself. Uh, he was obviously fairly prosperous. Uh, <clears throat> but it explains something which I think you're probably going to come on to next, which is my education. Well, I was going to ask you about your relationship with your parents. Yeah. What was your, I mean, did you have a close relationship with your father or your mother? or Who was more influential or both? This sounds more like a psychiatrist's couch. <laughs> than... <laughs> we haven't started on that. <laughs> Um, it was a very, very warm, loving family. My father was undemonstrative, but neither I nor my siblings, I had two sisters and a brother, uh, <coughs> for a moment doubted how much he loved us. My mother was the exact opposite, terribly demonstrative, um, fed us to the gills. How would none of us have, all, none of us have died of heart attacks from the food she fed us? <laughs> I simply don't know. Um, and they packed me off to boarding school. Yeah. Well, but, uh, I mean, could I just go along one particular avenue to, to start with before we get to that because your father was a member of the Communist Party you yourself uh, became a member of the Communist Party and, and were a member of the party for quite a long time yeah. I mean was that you said your father's influence but can you say something about that Well, <coughs> to, to, to answer the question I need to go back to my school days I was sent to um, a preparatory school Belmont, which is the preparatory school for Mill Hill, quite near where we lived. We moved to Mill Hill after the war. My father was demobilised. He'd spent the war um, in the Eighth Army. And when I was nine years old, my father stood as a communist candidate in a local election. I can't remember if it was a parliamentary or a borough election. So his posters with his name and face on were everywhere. I was being privately educated at a school where... The teachers used to take me aside and say, what are you doing here? Your father's a communist. Uh, I was um, taunted, as you can imagine, repeatedly about it. And the only choice at that stage, when you're a little boy of nine, is to either repudiate everything about your family or to get into fistfights over it. Well, I got into fistfights. I used to come home almost every day with my knuckles and knees grazed. I never told my parents what the fights were about. Uh, and found myself, in effect, a partisan of my father's <coughs> politics from an early age. Um, and so <coughs> that then continued? Sorry? That then continued? Yes, yes, I mean, no, not in any direct sense, but uh, mm. that, that was the way, the way I, I, I grew up. Uh, years later, I met um, the young teacher, 
then young teacher, Dick Tavern, who came and taught me Greek and Latin for a year. And the first thing he said to me was, are you still a communist? <laughs> <laughs> the age of 11 or 12 this was. Um, yeah. what, uh, so you, you go to the prep school and then you went to Miller Hill itself. I mean, did that have a big influence on you uh, in terms of any particular teachers, uh, in terms of what you studied? Because um, I know you mainly did la or you later you specialised in languages. Yes, I, I was a good, good linguist and um, I'd... Um, at Belmont, um, I mean, d discipline was really rather raw. The gym slipper was used both for educational and for disciplinary purposes. And um, we were beaten if we didn't learn the weekend's homework, beaten in front of the class, the weekend's homework of learning uh, perhaps a whole Keats ode off by heart, which was quite a lot. Milton's Lycidas, a dozen verses from Gray's Elegy. I could still recite them all to you now, uh, but they were terrorised into me. Um, I got a scholarship to Mill Hill um, when I was a, a year underage, and that gave me a good, a good academic start. And that, then I retook the scholarship a year later and um, improved it. But you could only take up the scholarship as a boarder, with the result that I was boarding a mile and a half from my home. Mm -hmm. It was slightly absurd and actually rather painful to be packed off away from your brothers and sisters and your family three times a year to an alien environment, which I didn't much like where I did get a very good education. Um, French and German were my uh, main subjects. I learned Spanish as well. Mm. What, so you then, I mean, did you want to add anything about the influence of the school? I mean, you mentioned Dick Tavern as one of the... Well, the yes, I mean, we're, we're now good friends in, in, in our respective old ages. But um, he, he'd come to the school to do a year's teaching mm. after he'd come down from Oxford. We all thought he was wonderful because he, he used to swear and do things that other teachers didn't do. Uh, the, the teaching at Mill Hill was of very high order. My, my um, German and French teacher was excellent. And I got a scholarship to Cambridge on the strength of it. Yeah. Well, you then go to Cambridge and you go to Queen's College and you read... English, not modern languages. Yes. Well, I did a disastrous year of economics, intending to move to law. Bored out of my brain, had my scholarship reduced to an exhibition, quite right, I had to be thrown out nowadays, and decided this was silly to do another boring subject for another two years. Um, and I switched to English, which was a fantastically good move, because the Cambridge English School, this is around 1960, had absolutely everybody who was worth listening to teaching there. Um, Frank Levis was still teaching, but, uh, attracting huge audiences of acolytes uh, and fighting all his old battles with great bitterness. But I was lectured by George Rylands on the Augustans, Muriel Bradbrook on the Elizabethans, David Daitches on Burns. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time. And my tutors were John Holloway and Donald Davy in successive years, both of the very <coughs> distinguished critics and poets as well as teachers. I couldn't have had a better time. Mm. I guess the question then becomes, why didn't you become an academic? Or why didn't you go into teaching? If I'd got a first, I might have done. But um, I, as we all say when we get two ones, I just missed a first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my father said, look, I think I've supported you for quite long enough. Do you mind getting a proper job? <laughs> In those days, uh, I'm ashamed to say the bar was a ridiculously easy profession to enter. It was a non-graduate profession. You didn't need a degree at all. The exams were quite elementary. Uh, you could retake them if you failed them as often as you wanted. And um, you could cram for one of the part one papers within about six weeks, so it lets you spare time to do other things. And I made quite a lot of use of my spare time. So it was to get a job, was it? Essentially, to get a job. I mean, of you course, I knew. A clerk or a civil servant, or of course, I knew that, that my father would probably send me some work, and he did send me a little work. Uh, but the, the reality was that um, there was work to be had at the bar. The bar was then about two thousand strong. It, it had shrunk from its um, post-war numbers, and um, legal aid 
was starting to be used by solicitors to augment their practices. The result that there was in the mid-1960s when I was called to the bar, more work than the bar could handle. It was a, it was a seller's market in advocacy. Yeah, yeah. Your father says you have to earn some income, and you earn some income as a part-time musician and translator. Mm. Um, there may be Bob Dylan fans in the audience, but apparently he lent his guitar on one occasion to Bob Dylan at the, at the troubadour. Um, I don't know whether you want to explain that. Uh, <laughs> if this there is are the, any. The, in, a, in, a, in a long and in some ways interesting career, this is the only thing that ever interests people. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the we'll move on then. The, the, the backstory uh, back is that one of the jobs that I did while I was reading for the bar was some arranging and um, accompanying work for a company called Transatlantic Records, which was set up by an old college friend of mine, Matt Joseph. And um, one of the singers whose work we recorded was Sidney Carter, who is known, of course, as the author of The Lord of the Dance, but in fact wrote a huge number of very good, sec very funny secular songs. We've made an LP with Sheila Hancock of his songs. And um, Nat then got a booking for Sidney and a, a singer who did some of his songs, Nadia Cattuz, at the Troubadour, which is a basement folk club in Earl's Court. Uh, this was, uh, by my reckoning, about November 1962, uh, and I went down there to accompany Sydney that evening, together with my, uh, uh, my then brother-in-law, Ralph Trainer, who was also a, a musician. Um, and after the show was at the floor show, Sydney Carter and Nadia Cattuz was over, it was quite regular that the musicians would stay on and jam, and other musicians would drop in from other clubs. Some evenings, nothing happened, it fizzled out. But on this particular evening, it took off, and a number of very good musicians had come by. In the course of the evening, this must have been about midnight or one in the morning, one of the singers on the stage, who had come up on the stage with me, Judith Silva, pointed to this scruffy youth at the back of the um, audience and said, that's that American kid who's just made an LP. He did issue an LP in the States, which hadn't done at all well. It hadn't been issued in this country yet, so got him up on the stage, and he said, I haven't bought a guitar, so I lent him my Harmony Sovereign, and, which I still have. Ah, <laughs> and, that was the next and question. And borrowed Ralph's spare guitar. Yeah. And we had a very good jam session that lasted till about three in the morning. In the course of which, I mean, Dylan was described by Martin Carthy as having a mind like blotting paper. Um, he could pick up a song at one hearing. And um, he, two of the songs that were sung that night turned up on his next LP. Um, the Leaving of Liverpool became Boots of Spanish Leather. And Nottingham Town, I'm pretty sure Bert Yanch came in that night. Nottingham Town became Masters of War. Mm -hmm. Ross, could I interrupt and ask Stephen just to stand up to get himself a little bit, a bit closer, closer to Stephen? Yes, thanks. Yes. Sorry, my thank, thank you, Michael. Um, so you're doing the part time musician, but you're also uh, you're doing some writing. You published an anthology of. British folk songs. Yeah. Um, you also did a translation from the Spanish of poems written by a political one of Franco's political prisoners, yeah. um, Marcos Anno. And he was eventually released from the prison as a result of international pressure, and you became involved in um, uh, that uh, what the work that was later done in a way by Amnesty. Uh, this was a precursor to Amnesty in a way. But uh, you might want to tell us a bit about that, but I'm particularly interested because you, on one occasion, you um, became a courier for taking money that had been raised for political prisoners in Spain. Um, you acted as a courier and smuggled that money into into Spain and had some hair-raising experiences in the process. Yes, the appeal for amnesty in Spain was set up in around 1961, I think. Um, by a woman still alive called Eileen Turner. Um, it, it was a pre precursor of Amnesty International. Amnesty International didn't exist at the time. And it was concerned, concerned solely with a large number of political prisoners who were still in Franco's jail and had been jails and had been since the end of the Civil War. 
which ended in 1939. Poems have been smuggled out. They were smuggled out in minuscule script on pieces of toilet paper and drawings by a painter called Agostini Barola. The poems were by Marco Sanna, who had gone in as an illiterate teenager, been taught to read and write by the other political prisoners, and had become uh, quite a competent poet, and Vidal de Nicolas, a younger poet, who had been jailed in the post-war years. Um, I, I did ask me, if, uh, as I said uh, before, I, I'd done Spanish to, as a third language, to O level. Asked me if I'd translate some of the poems. And while I was working on them, Marcos was released because his, his case was because they were cause celebre and, and an embarrassment to the Franco regime. Came to London a few days after he was released. I was given the job of taking him round, buying him some new clothes. And um, generally supporting him because he was still getting attacks of vertigo because he'd not been further than a few feet from a wall for 22 years. Um, and he said to me at one point, uh, how old are you? I said, I, I think I was 22. He said, I was put in jail a year before you were born. And that was something of a bombshell mm. um, to realise that you could be in jail for a whole of a person's life. Uh, it had a some effect on me as a sentencing judge in later years, I think. Mm. Now, what about the fundraising? The appeal for amnesty in Spain organised an amazing auction of donated works of art. Eileen got Picasso to donate a painting. And with that, every major artist in Western Europe donated sculptures or paintings. And a large sum of money was raised in an auction at Bonhams, who waived their usual commission for it. Uh, but the, the question was how to get the money where it was needed. And um, I knew nothing about what was going on until in 1966, I was um, going on holiday to, with my sister and her children to Collier. Eileen, hearing about this, said, um, could you just let run a little errand into Spain for me? <laughs> and I ended up... Uh, I still don't know why I still didn't say no, because um, I was at the bar by then, and I would have certainly been disbarred if I'd been caught, um, with a file, a, a buff folder, containing a large sum of money in greenback dollars, list of Spanish political prisoners' families who were in need of money, because most of them were destitute, and were also, or also the families could buy food for the, for the husband who was in jail, uh, and an address in Barcelona, which was the address of um, Antonio Gutierrez Diaz, who was um, then a young paediatrician who just had a jail sentence himself and just come out, later became a very distinguished Euro MP. I crossed the frontier in my mini at Serbe. I left my sister and her children in Collier. Crossed at Serbe, which is a very small frontier post. I was just setting off down the Spanish side when I waved into the side of the road by the lieutenant of the civil guard with an automatic weapon on his arm. He pulls open the passenger door, climbs into the passenger seat and says, Vamos. So I thought, well, either they know what I'm up to, in which case I'm a dead man, well, they don't, in which case I'd better just keep driving. <laughs> so I drove down um, into the frontier town on the Spanish side where he said, stop, got out and waved me on. It turned out that the civil guard had weapons but no transport, <laughs> and they travelled on and off shift by hijacking passing motorists. Let's go back a step. Uh, admission to the bar, you cram... You cram for the bar, as you could in those days. I did it as well. You, you have to eat your dinners. You tell the story that on one occasion you miscounted and ate five rather than six dinners for the term and so had to eat another six dinners for the next term. But you're finally called uh, in November 1964. You initially go to 10 King's Bench Walk um, to Chambers there. What's the background to that? How did you get access to Chambers? Of course, well, these days, you know, students, some of whom might be here, find it extremely difficult. Yes. Well, it's embarrassing to, to say so, but um, the equal opportunities hadn't been heard of in those days. You got a pupillage by getting an introduction to a, a barrister. And my father introduced me to a barrister who he had a high regard for, Ralph Milner, who he used to brief. And Ralph took me as a pupil. It was as simple as that. Um, and I had a very 
very good and rigorous pupillage, uh, first with him and then with a criminal practitioner, Peter Perrins. And um, the end of it was offered a tenancy in Ralph's chambers. And you stayed there for a couple of years? Stayed there for a couple of years, and then Ralph decided that he was fed up with fighting about money for people he didn't care about, and um, packed in the bar, went off to teach Italian at London University. Uh, and I joined um, what was then John Platts Mills Chambers, yes. Cloisters, where I spent the rest of my time at the bar. Yeah. You've written, of course, about him, a New Zealander, I should add. Um, but uh, you're then joined by other people like Michael Mansfield and Bill Bertels and Laura Cox and so on. Um, you've explained to me the, the move. You, say, you said earlier in the conversation that there was lots of work at the bar. Um, you were doing what sort of work? I, I mean, you tell the story. I, I'll just very quickly, it, in your lectures, your Hamlin lectures, you tell about the uh, demonstrations, and I think you're saying that you must have represented some because you, you got this conversation at the mag before the magistrates, before the mags, where uh, counsel says, tell me, Sergeant, have you ever heard the expression of speak a free country? This is someone who's been arrested for demonstrating. Police sergeant says suspiciously, yes, sir. Counsel, what do you suppose it means? Police sergeant, never really thought about it, sir. Magistrate, can you leave politics out of this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a fairly typical exchange on a Monday morning at Maryland. But what, what was the practice? Well, my, my practice was a, was a completely mixed one, very uh, normal for common law juniors. Um, small crime escalating over the years to rather more serious crime. I found myself defending in I think, two or three IRA bombing trials. Um, undefended divorces, which paid five guineas and were a bit of a pushover unless something went wrong. And your client had admitted in the witness box that he had committed adultery when he hadn't put in a discretion statement. But was, uh, barring accidents like that, it was good bread and butter. And uh, an increasing amount of personal injury work, Thompson's, and it used to send me uh, quite a lot of work for plaintiffs. Uh, and there was the occasional brief for an insurance company. So it was a, very, it was a good mixed common law practice. And, and crime? And cr well, crime, yes. The, um, the, the, I mean, the, the magistrate's court work was part of the staple. But the uh, most interesting criminal work, uh, as it happened, was work that I was sent by a very nice single man practice solicitor called Peter Kingshill. Peter had come here as a teenager, as a refugee from Nazi Germany. He lived in Kent, where a local, local architect had put some, some of the local gypsies onto him because they were constantly being prosecuted for being camped on roadside verges. The local authorities were closing the commons under new statutory powers, failing to exercise their power to open sites to replace the commons. The gypsies were being driven onto the roadsides. At that time, under the, I think it was the 1959 Highways Act, it was a criminal offence to be a gypsy encamped on a highway. And we, with Peter's help, we took 32 of these cases, convictions together to the Croydon Quarter Sessions, where we got all 32 quashed on the ground that the police had failed to prove that my clients were gypsies. <laughs> <laughs> the police attitude was anybody can tell by looking at them their gypsies, and that was good enough. So my stocks were quite high, and I used to go down regularly after that to, um, usually to Seven Oaks Magistrates Court, with a tape, tape recorder in my car. And after we finished in court, I would um, get some of my clients, either they or people they could introduce me to, to sing me songs from their mm. repertoire. And I picked up some very, very good singers, one particular singer, um, Joe, so Joe Cooper, he was an old poacher from whom I have tapes of poaching songs, transportation songs, jail songs. Um, some of, and some of them, the love songs, fed into the book you mentioned, which was published in 1967. Yes, yes, yes. Look, I'm just going to pause briefly. If people want a piece of paper on which to write questions, we can distribute them. There's at least one off the back. Um, as well as the court work, you appeared in a number of inquiries, a number of public inquiries, and in 1974 you appeared with Bill Bertels for Warwick University Students Union and the NUS before the inquiry that Lord Scarman undertook for uh, 
Roy Jenkins, then the Home Secretary, into the Red Line, Lion Square disorders. There was a young student who was uh, killed in, in, that, in those clashes. And you then also appeared before Lord Scarman representing the Council for Racial Equality before the Brixton Riots Inquiry, which was, which was subsequently. But um, you uh, developed a, a good relationship with Lord Scarman as a result of that, but um, uh, are there any experiences coming out of those inquiries? I think you also did the, uh, the, the were you in the Grunwick inquiry as well? Yes, that's right. I did all three of Scarman's uh, mainland inquiries. He did a fourth one in Northern Ireland. That's right. Yes. Scarman was, um, uh, in many ways, the model judge. He was courteous, dignified, very firm, very, le- very knowledgeable, Um, I wrote his biography for the Dictionary of National Biography. Um, Rather interestingly, found that Tom Bingham, who was a member of his chambers, um, thought him rather sanctimonious. Well, this came out in the interview I did with Tom Bingham here at the LSE. He he made that that apparent, did he? And also rather disconcertingly, the the head of his chambers, who Tom liked more, was the ghastly Melford Stevenson, Melford Stevenson had a vitriolic but extremely f- brilliant sense of humour, and Tom rather rather admired that. But, uh, you have been at the bar for uh, um, what two decades, and you then become a QC. Yeah. You've told me on on another occasion that you had to try four times. Mm. You had Scarman support. You had support from other people like Gordon Slynn. Um, Nigel Bridge, yeah. subsequently members of the House of Lords. Um, why? Well, we need to go, go back. Um, I joined the Communist Party, as you've said, um, when I went up to Cambridge as a student. I hadn't been a member before that. Uh, I was approached and asked if I would like to join, and in effect, I said, why not? Uh, it wasn't a, an avid commitment, uh, but um, in a sense, I was already there from the school days that um, we've spoken about. Um, It it was never a secret, and Denning uh, knew perfectly well what my politics were. I appeared before Denning in quite a lot of cases, always for the sort of people who Denning hated most, gypsies, students, (laughs) trade unionists, on it went, and I never won a case in Denning's court. I left the Communist Party in the early 1980s and uh, that was in consequence in large part of something perhaps we ought to come back to which was Czechoslovakia in 1968. Um, so I left the party but um, when I started applying for Silk as you say I was turned down um, three times and um, was given Silk on the fourth application which I decided was going to be my last if that failed I was going to pack it in. Um, which coincided with or followed immediately after Denning's enforced retirement. Uh, my, it was maybe only a suspicion, but my suspicion that Denning, it was Denning who was blocking me was um, compounded by the fact that I'd also been nominated in the previous year by the Coal Board and the National Union of Mine Workers jointly to be the next president of the National Reference Tribunals, which was the final... Um, stage of the national wage bargaining structure for the coal mining industry. This was an appointment which had to be made by the Master of the Rolls um, on the joint uh, recommendation of the coal board and the union. But it was a mere, the, the approval was a mere formality. And somehow it sat on Denning's desk for months and months and months and never came. And at the same time as I was finally given silk, John Donaldson, the new Master of the Rolls, approved my appointment as the president of the tribunals. So it may be only a suspicion, but it was a co- <laughs> coincidence. Uh, uh, you said it was a result of Czechoslovakia that you left the Communist Party. Do you want to say a bit more about Not that? a direct result, but I, I was um, in, in Czechoslovakia in Prague in ni- August 1968 on what was the belated honeymoon. Um, we'd been there for ten days living in a friend's flat. The friends had got the passports for the first time, a Czech couple and had gone on a camping holiday to Yugoslavia. 
and we were staying in the flat in the south of Prague. Mm. Uh, <coughs> and taking and sort of imbibing the Prague Spring. I mean, there were concerts, concerts in the churches being given free by the orchestras, huge public discussions taking place in all kinds of forums, um, television carrying documentary programs critical of the regime, and so, so on. And um, then one night, overnight, the country was occupied. A neighbour knocked on our door and said, we think you might not know what's going on, but the Warsaw Pact has moved in. And looked out of the window, there were tanks rolling up the street. Um, uh, we stayed two more days, but then there were food shortages, and we decided it wasn't right to compete with Czechs for what there was. And so we, we left, but... Um, this was a turning point. It was a watershed, not only for me, but for the Western Communist parties, in fact, all of whom subsequently broke with the Soviet Union over Czechoslovakia. And um, this led to a, a, a parting of the ways, which um, was actually quite decisive in, in Western politics. Uh, I, I, I stayed in the party for a while, but left it... Um, I say around 1982. You're now in Silk. You have a very big practice. Um, you, I mentioned to you that uh, the inquiry you did for the Lambeth Council into the death of a two-year-old, but uh, given time, maybe we won't go into that. But you also build up a big public law practice as well. Um, it was mainly local authorities, was it? No. Um, the local authority cases tend to be the ones that get reported because the local oh, government review... I did a Westall search. Yes, well, that's what you... Law reporting is, uh, is actually a very distorting thing on a career because it, it tends to pick up things that are of editorial interest, not necessarily of, of, of legal or, or, or forensic interest. That's many a brilliant judgment not reported. Yes, well, you know the feeling. <laughs> And others reported where you wonder yeah, what, exactly. why on earth they're bothering. Um, no, the um, uh, public law work grew almost by itself in, in the years in which I was at the bar. Um, I, perhaps I'll just give a sort of plug to my, the book that's coming out later this year, because I've, this is my, essentially my Oxford lectures on the history of public law. But I put in a prefatory, an introductory chapter, trying to describe what it was like being educated in law at a time when public law wasn't even taught, wasn't on the syllabus, and being partly a witness to and partly a participant in the growth of a whole new system of law, or the regrowth, because of course we were rediscovering what the Victorians had already known in terms of public law. Um, I should mention, I think, at this stage, not only that I'm very lucky in the colleagues I worked with. I mean, you've mentioned three of my former pupils, um, Bill Bertels, Laura Cox. I, I forget who. I mentioned Mansfield. Mansfield wasn't my pupil. No. But anyway, but there's also the solicitors who are working mostly in high street practices and picking up this work and sending me the work to whom I really owe my career. Um, people like Geoffrey Bineman, Henry Hodge, Gareth Pierce, Jim Nicholl, uh, and Larry Grant and his predecessor, Harry, and his successor, Harriet Harbin, at the NCCL. Uh, these were the real pioneers of, on whom the bar depended for its work. And, and, they, and they, they do deserve a tribute. Yeah. Um, as I said, you, you made your mark, and you just said you're going. We, we look forward to that. That was the commercial. We look forward to the book. But um, you uh, started to make submissions, which were picked up in judgments, which is often the case. I mean, mm. council submissions are plagiarised. Uh, but your submissions on, for example, consultation have just recently been uh, approved yet again, but this time by the Supreme Court. Um, but did you? Uh, I mean, were, did you have a, a, a philosophy? philosophy or were you just trying to win, win the case which is what barristers have to do um, trying to win the case but you do have a, some philosophy one of the things that um, I did try to make a reality of 
at the bar was to listen to the client and to try to reproduce in some way in the argument what it was that concerned the client. Um, frequently that was a disastrous strategy <laughs> because it meant that, for example, you, you see, appear to be dragging in irrelevant or political considerations into the argument. Uh, sometimes it, it was beneficial. Uh, but, um, I mean, I can certainly remember um, the, the Helen Smith case, the young nurse who fell to her death from a balcony in Jeddah and whose father spent years trying to get an inquest into her death in this country at a time when coroners would only sit on deaths that occurred here, not on deaths that occurred abroad. Um, Ron, her father, was a former policeman, was desperate to use the court to expose what he believed was a cover-up about the circumstances of her death. The only way to win the case was to ignore that and simply go on the pure legal question as to whether the coroner had jurisdiction over a body the body of a person who had died abroad. And it took a terrific struggle to persuade Ron that this was the only way to go. But I did. And we won the case um, by sticking to the legal issue. And I'm afraid that that is the way. When um, later I was um, asked by the Lord Chancellor's head of judicial appointments about a seat on whether I was interested in the bench, and I said, you'd never appoint me. I'm much too left-wing. He said, no, you've got... A, Good write-ups from the law lords. Desmond Agnes says you leave your politics at the door of the court. Uh, I thought, how many of my clients would be cross if they heard that? <laughs> Let me ask you about your appointment to the court, because it was... Was it a surprise to you? Because I think it was probably a surprise to, you know, the... Well, by the time it happened, I knew it was, it was, I knew it was coming. I, it got, yes, it got sort of press coverage um, as a... <coughs> Uh, a, a new step. Mackay was the Lord Chancellor at the time. Although, whether appointing a white, male, middle-class, public school, Oxbridge-educated <laughs> judge to the bench was any kind of a new departure at all, <laughs> Kate, Kate Mallison, who I see in the audience, will have to say. Uh, but, um, no, I was asked to come in, ostensibly to talk about my sittings as an assistant recorder by the head of judicial appointments. And when he said to me, I want to know if you're serious, I was genuinely bamboo bamboozled. I said, serious about what? He said, about becoming a judge. And that's when I said to him, you'd never appoint me. But within a year, they, Mackay had offered me a seat on the bench. Mm. Yeah. When you're at the bar um, and uh, also as a judge, you're writing, and you're writing mm. in particular for the uh, London Review of Books, and a lot of those um, uh, writings are in, um, this is another advertisement, uh, Ashes and Sparks. Uh, or, uh, I mean, you, it, it's difficult certainly as a judge to write, not so much as a, a, someone at the bar, but uh, you, you also did a famous piece, still quoted, on judges' lodgings um, and the palaver associated with that. Um, but you, did you have any difficulty with writing in the London Review of Books while you were a judge? No, I mean, you know, it was a spare time occupation. Uh, but um, when I was offered the seat on the bench, I said to the Permanent Secretary, Tom Lake, I wouldn't take it unless I could go on writing for the LRB and other mm. periodicals. And Tom, who read the LRB, said, that'll be all right. We've, we've abolished the Kilmuir rules, but you can't be as rude about Margaret Thatcher as you were in the last issue. <laughs> and I said, no, that, that's understood. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. You, uh, obviously, as you start as a high court judge, um, you start to make your mark in, in um, public court judgments, then on appeal. Can I ask you the same question I asked you about the bar? I mean, it, obviously here in these lectures you do express a certain philosophy, if I can call it that, mm. but did you have a, a philosophy of public law that you then applied as much as you could within the confines of the cases argued before you? Um, no, is the, is the short answer. Uh, uh, judging is essentially a reactive process. Mm. I think it's quite dangerous to enter judging as if it were a proactive 
process. You're reacting to the, the, the issues that are brought before you. Uh, that said, I did have and do have certain views about what public law is about in particular. Um, I was dissatisfied with the explanation of it as an application of the Wednesbury principles, uh, as if it was a kind of tick list, and you either got tick the boxes or you didn't. Uh, I very much favoured, and still favour, the view that public law is about the abuse of power, and that, that, and that the categories that you find in Wensbury are simply illustrations of how power can be abused. If you can call that a philosophy, that, that was a philosophy. But beyond that, no, um, I, I don't think I, I've um, carried any kind of prior concept of what law should be doing into the law. That said, I know that people um, in the academic world spend lifetimes writing about what judges have been doing and saying and, and classifying their philosophy. I don't mind that at all. I, I've learned a certain amount from reading things about myself. Uh, and um, it's probably a good thing that somebody should look at what judges are doing and either classify or characterize them in some way. But I think the last person to do that usefully is probably the judge himself. Yeah. What, what, uh, I mean, just take another case outside the public law area, Douglas and Hello, where you express views about privacy. Yeah which weren't sort of taken up by others? Well, you say they weren't, but they weren't and then they were. Um, the, um, I took the view, where, perhaps I could just go back a little. I was opposed for many years to a Bill of Rights uh, because it seemed to me that it was something which would be picked up and run away with by the rich and the powerful. Um, I became a convert uh, in the course of actually having to run the, the training sessions, the 62 seminars for the Judicial Studies Board for the judiciary about the Human Rights Act. And uh, then it looked as if everything I had previously pre predicted was coming true when the first customers were at the door of my court after the Human Rights Act came into force, <laughs> Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones. <laughs> uh, but there was a genuine privacy issue and I took the view that you didn't need the Convention uh, and the um, uh, Human Rights Act <coughs> to uh, establish a right of privacy which would um, protect uh, what they were seeking to protect. Uh, I took the view that the common law could do it. Um, <coughs> and although that was um, initially... Uh, dissed, if I can use the expression, <laughs> by Lord Hoffman in um, the Wainwright case. If you go and look at the Naomi Campbell case, which he heard subsequently, before Wainwright had reached Europe, reached Strasbourg, where we got a hammering on it, you will see that Lenny Hoffman turns round on common law and privacy. Uh, it's about the only time that Lenny has ever agreed with me probably didn't say that, though. He says it in a very delicate way. <laughs> <laughs> um, you uh, didn't get to the House of Lords or the Supreme Court. We both know the vagaries of judicial promotions. You engage with universities. You have appointments at various universities. You become involved in various organizations. You, you're the president of the British Institute of Human Rights, the British Tinnitus Association, and so on. You continue with your writing. We could go on. Um, I'm instructed to pause after 45 minutes. I've now gone a bit longer than that. You're now teaching at Oxford, I should add that, and you, you've said that because you're, you're, the new book is going to be based on those lectures. I think we might just pause. Mm. And uh, have we got questions written down? So the first question is, do you think there's such a thing as the establishment? And if so, has your proximity to it changed your views of its influence? <laughs> this is 
like an, an essay question. <laughs> um, yes, um, of course there is such a thing as the establishment. There are, power, power resides in places uh, to which most people can't uh, fi find access. Um, proximity to it is a nice way of putting it. It's a judge or part of it. Uh, and um, one of the things that I think one finds about it is that it's a, it's a warm bath, it's a welcoming place, uh, as long as you're not rocking the boat, to ch change the metaphor. Mm. Uh, perhaps I should just give one little illustration of this. When I first went out on circuit, it was to Birmingham in 1992. As a high court judge. The high court judge. Yeah. To, to yeah, for the provinces. Yes, the provinces. <laughs> I was greeted by the, the butler, who said, will it be the Times or the Telegraph, my lord? And I said, the Guardian. And the frisson <laughs> was palpable. But f not many years later, when Tom Bingham had become Chief Justice, he came out to, uh, to Newcastle, where I was on circuit, uh, to do some sitting himself. He, he was a good hands-on Chief Justice. And uh, I, by then, had the Guardian on all of the staff knew that I'd had the Guardian. But the Binghams ordered two Guardians, one each for him and Elizabeth. I think this is the kind of thing that led Peter Hitchens to make the remark <laughs> that Michael Lobben has quoted. I've got uh, a very long and interesting question about the um, Chagosians uh, expelled from their Indian Ocean islands. Um, and the question is about the significant jurisprudence that's been developed as a result of that case, both here and elsewhere. And specifically, uh, the question is, was it satisfactory that the case, when it went to the House of Lords, was decided by only five of the judges, who split 3-2, given the importance of the legal principles at stake? Mm. Um. Perhaps I could mention, I'm, uh, when, when, on the one occasion when I applied for the Supreme Court, when the, the Judicial Appointments Commission was first established, the form, which I refused to go back to, which asked you for things like proof of your own integrity, um, also asked you to add, to append anything, judgments, or other writings you're particularly proud of. And I appended my judgment in the Chagos Islanders case in the Court of Appeal knowing that on the panel was going to be the judge, one of the judges who made the majority against me in the, high, in, in the House of Lords. And seven of us, th two in the Divisional Court, three in the Court of Appeal, and two in the House of Lords, sided with the Chagossians and, they, and lost to the three who made the majority in the Lords. Um, not only would it have been desirable for there to be a seven judge or larger court, but almost any other composition of the Lords than that particular one would have resulted in a majority for the islanders. Mm -hmm. What about the uh, jurisprudence that developed? Um, well, uh, I don't know how far it ha has developed. I mean, the, in effect, the, our judgment was overturned on the facts and not on the law. So to that extent, um, what we decided... Um, on, for example, the um, Colonial Laws uh, Validity Act and so on remain, remains good. But that wasn't overturned by the Lords. I'm not quite sure what the question has in mind uh, more generally. Well, maybe it's Ian Orr, who's a retired member of the UK Diplomatic Service. Maybe we can discuss that in conversation later on. But he's got another unrelated second question, and I haven't got any more questions yet, so I'm going to this excellent question... What are your views of Ewan McCall as a dramatist and as a folk singer? <laughs> uh, this is what politicians say. I'm glad you asked me that question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, politicians don't say it when they don't mean it. Uh, um, Please be careful. I, 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 I knew Ewan McCall. In fact, his widow, Peggy Seeger, is a neighbour of ours in Oxford now. Um, and I wrote a short obituary of him uh, for, a, for a periodical called, I think, Red Letters, when he died. McColl was an astonishing man. He was vain, 
uh, he created a persona for himself, um, which was almost a dramatic part that he played in his life. But he had a, a wonderful ear for music and for verse. He composed some quite superb songs. And one of the formative influences in my life was going as a t- teenager, before I'd gone to Cambridge, in fact, to the Singers' Club in a pub called the New Merlin's Cave in, in the near King's Cross. And hearing Ewan singing some of the great Scots ballads, Johnny O'Cockersley, uh, Hugh the Graham, uh, I, I can still remember the chill that went down my spine listening to them. Uh, he had an amazing sense of drama. Later, he wrote a very fine pre- presentation for the, um, one of the anniversaries of the co-op movement, uh, which, I, again, I've got the text of, and which um, had some wonderful verse, prose, and song in it. Uh, I have a very high regard for him as an artist. You, this is the next question. You've described your career at a time when legal aid expanded access to mm. justice. How do you see the issue of access to justice by the less well-off developing in the next few years? Oh, it's a grim picture, isn't it? Um, it's, abs- it's ironic that in the 800th year of Magna Carta, promising that justice would not be denied to anybody, we're watching the butchery of access to justice, uh, both by the withdrawal of legal aid and by the attempt to limit the um, circumstances in which judicial review challenges could be brought against central government. You, you did ask before, Ross, about whether most of my public law work was um, local authority work. Um, in general, it wasn't. It was mostly against central government. Mm. Uh, never for central government. Central government wasn't generous in its distribution of base. But that was in those days because all their work was done by a single treasury devil. Now they divide the work up. All so, their chambers. Yes. Well, my first treasury devil was Nigel Bridge. Uh, I can remember getting to my feet, quaking with terror in Lord Parker's court to um, uh, argue a case against a rent officer who had failed to adjourn a hearing when um, the tenant was ill. Uh, of course, we'd not been taught anything in bar school about how you did this. It wasn't a tort claim. It wasn't a contract claim. There was something called certiorari and mandamus that you could get. And uh, I still remember the, the sensation <laughs> when Nigel Bridge got to his feet. The court picked up their pens for the first time. <laughs> and Parker said, yes, Mr. Bridge, and Bridge conceded the case. <laughs> the next question is about how do we make the senior judiciary more diverse? Why have we only ever had one female Supreme Court judge? I would add a scandalous situation. It's appalling. Um, But it's interesting that the old system of the Lord Chancellor's tap on the shoulder, of which I was a beneficiary, and which in many ways worked perfectly well. The only thing that was wrong with it was that it was completely indefensible as a system. (laughs) It has been replaced by the Judicial Appointments Commission, which has improved the balance somewhat, but nowhere near corrected it. I think the answer is is actually not far away. And that is that it's not the appointment system, it's the legal profession that doesn't give women and ethnic minorities the chance that the really good, high-profile cases, which enable often very average white male barristers to make their mark and um, get the kind of CV together that you need for a judicial appointment. Uh, I, I, I chaired the, the Bar Council's Sex Discrimination Committee for the first five years of its existence, from about 1988 to 1993. And with Tony Hooper, who chaired the Race Relations Committee in those years, we put together the first, first, profession, first equal opportunities policy that any profession in this country had adopted. Uh, And it's done something, but not nearly enough, to correct the imbalances in the kind of work that women are able to get in order to show their their ability. Mm. Any more questions? I've got one. Oh, excellent. Because I'm running out. (laughs) We never get questions when I ask for questions about the subject of the conversation, but uh, that doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Um, the question is, if you're a betting man or woman, you're not a man, um, how much would you bet on the government failing to get the Human Rights Act abolished? <laughs> um, I, I'm not a betting man. Um, on the rare occasions when I've placed a bet, I've always lost. I've never won a bet. So I, by bitter experience, I, I know that it's not a good idea. Um, it's, a very, it's impossible to know what one's dealing with. The critiques of the Human Rights Act are factually false. We are not, the judge at courts are not, as the law at present stands, obliged to follow Strasbourg's rulings. Parliament is not, as the law stands, obliged to legislate in obedience to Strasbourg's rulings. So the whole attack is based upon false premises. You could, if, therefore, the Human Rights Act were to be repealed and replaced by a British Bill of Rights, it couldn't go further than the Human Rights Act already does in allowing the courts, as they say, the Supreme Court to be supreme here and Parliament to be sovereign. What this is about, of course, is, not, is probably not the textual content of the Human Rights Act or the Convention at all. It's about getting out of Europe. Uh, Strasbourg is seen by Europhobe, Europhobes as the Achilles heel of the system. And if we could get, be dragged out of Strasbourg, then it becomes easier to drag us out of Brussels. And I think that's probably what the agenda is. We've got another question coming from off the back, I know. But uh, could I just go back, uh, since I have to fill some time, um, and ask you about your... Uh, you said you were, you were of immigrant families, in a way, or your parents were. Yes. Did you, have you ever traced them back and worked out what the history was? Um, I, I have a, a cousin who's the family archivist who keeps digging up new things. But the, as with most East European immigrant Jewish families, the trail goes cold um, in the late 19th century. Um, you, can, you usually find where Grandpa came from. But beyond that... It tends to be only the, the rabbinical families who, who know what the ancestry was behind that. Uh, I know, and my cousins know, really nothing beyond the time when my paternal grandmother, at the age of eight, was sent to work in a sweatshop doing crochet work, learning crochet work. Her brother used to come and carry her home on his shoulders fast asleep. And from 1913, we have a photograph of my grandfather, her husband, standing outside his new shop in Bethnal Green with his name on the facial board. My father, aged four, standing beside him. And the window filled with lace and crochet work, all made by my grandmother in the back room. Uh, so no, no, um, no knowledge, as it were, as to why they came to the UK or why they didn't end up no, in I mean, it was, the it was United a, States or... It was a combination of, um, of, economic, uh, of, of fleeing from persecution. I mean, the pogroms were very real and uh, wanting a better life economically. My maternal grandfather's brother did go to America. Every Jewish family has a story that they thought they were going to America and they were swindled by, by a crooked sea captain into believing that the port of London was New York <laughs> or Birkenhead or wherever it was. They were disembarked. Um, but my, the, the, the branch of my family that went to America, um, my American cousins, <laughs> all of them over six foot three inches tall. <laughs> and I find it extraordinary. None of us were anywhere near that size, and this side of the Atlantic. And I find it extraordinary that this could have happened. And it must be something to do with diet, I suppose. Uh, but, but who knows? And incidentally, one of my American cousins leads um, is the lead, Ray Benson is the lead singer of a group called Sleep at the Wheel, uh, which does country rock and is very successful. Good. Um, two more questions, and I think we'll then um, uh, draw to a close. Can you expand on your experiences defending alleged IRA members? Um, not a lot. I mean, these are criminal trials like any other um, there, wasn't a, there wasn't any defense of uh, ide ideological excuse or necessity um, they were 
very, very fiercely prosecuted for understandable reasons. Uh, but I do remember one occasion when the jury was being sworn for a trial that was going to be conducted by Melford Stevenson. And a middle-aged man came to, was handed the Bible and told to take the oath and said to the judge, I don't think I can bear to try this case. I understand it's about Ireland. Nonsense, said Melford. You take the oath or you'll be in contempt of court. The chap persisted and said, I really don't think I can do this. Melford said, you'll go to jail for contempt if you don't take the oath. And the man said, look, I'm sorry, my lord, but I believe that Ireland should be free. Stand down, says Melford. <laughs> of questions. Has the shift to legislation over the intelligence and security services and thus the involvement of the courts constrained or enhanced the state's power in these areas? I th think I'm going to have to say um, read my next book. I've got a chapter <laughs> dealing with aspects like th of this. But uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually too deep a question, I think, to answer shortly. Yeah. Uh, the, did you enjoy sitting more on a panel uh, of the Court of Appeal or alone in the High Court. With which judge did you positively enjoy sitting and why? Um, the first part of the question, uh, it's a lonely business, as you know, Ross, being a single judge. Um, you, you, there's nobody to bounce your ideas off unless you go and annoy a uh, a neighbour or a friend and say, what do you think about this? And they're probably too busy to give you much time. Uh, but I did enjoy being a Queen's Bench judge. Um, you got a, a sense of purpose, a sense that you were resolving real issues and mostly getting, getting them right. Uh, the Court of Appeal is a lovely court because it's a collegiate court. And by the time I came to retire in 2011, I think I regarded all the other judges there as friends as well as colleagues. That wasn't always the case. There were one or two judges when I first went to the Court of Appeal who I didn't like at all. And one particular judge, I won't name him, who I thought was an extremely cruel man uh, who took pleasure in inflicting unpleasantness, uh, both on counsel and on litigants. But luckily, that, that's, he, he wasn't replaced by anybody like himself. Any particular judge? Well, I'd, you ra I'd rather enjoy. not. Sorry? Any particular judge you especially enjoy sitting with? Um, judge? Yes. Uh, you never sat with me, so. Because <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, uh, 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 high court judges do sit in. A, a number, but. Court with other judges. And court I mean, there were judges I look forward to sitting with, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not going to name names. No, no, no. Uh, the last question, I think. Uh, did you become disillusioned with political ideology when you left the Communist Party, or did your ideology simply evolve into something else? Um, yes, disillusioned was, I think, a large part of it. I mean, I, I can't say that I'm sorry to have spent quite a lot of years in the same party as Neruda, Picasso, Shostakovich, Mandela, Paul Robeson, uh, there's no breast-beating regrets about it. But at the same time, by the beginning of the 1980s, long before the Berlin Wall came down, it was apparent to me that this was a highway to nowhere. Uh, it doesn't mean that the problems have been solved. Poverty, war, disease are all still as bad as they ever were. But the solution that I thought I knew about to them was not a solution, uh, betrayed by history, by events, by personalities, I suppose, but no longer a viable solution. Thanks very much for coming and for your questions. Stephen Sedley, thank you very much for answering questions. Um, and we look forward to the new book. So thanks very much. Thank you.